So again, my name is Bill Pachain. I'm the executive director for the APDA of Massachusetts and welcome to today's presentation. Uh, the APDA has been in operation for decades and offers programs and services to the PD community in Mass and surrounding states, as well as throughout the entire country. We've received a very large response for today's presentation. Uh, there has been a tremendous amount of progress in understanding and treating Parkinson's disease. And one of the goals that we have as an organization, as a chapter is make to make sure that we're bringing the uh, information to you as, as rapidly as we can. Parkinson's disease is highly individualized from person to person. Not all that is discussed today is relevant to everyone. The healthcare team must be familiar with signs, symptoms, and treatment strategies, and how PD impacts the individual patient. Treating Parkinson's disease requires a team approach, and today we'll hear from one of those individuals uh, from um, a, a complete team. Uh, today, we're providing information that is not intended as medical advice. So if you have any specific questions, either reach out to your local chapter, uh, the information referral center, and or reach back out to us. Thank you. Next slide, please. Today, we are doing a webinar. So we're not gonna be taking any questions live. If you do have questions, there is a Q&A button located at the very bottom panel of the Zoom. Type your question in the Q&A button and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can at the very end of today's presentation. So today I'd like to introduce today's presenter. Dr. Sarah K. Memo is the assistant professor at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst School of Public Health and Health Sciences. Her background is that she has a degree from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and a doctorate of philosophy, hearing science, and she attended there uh, from 2019 to 2014. She has a certificate in global public health uh, from UNC Gilling School of Global Public Health and a doctor of audiology that she received in 2008. Her areas of specialization include age-related hearing loss, community-based oral rehabilitation, and cognitive decline. Dr. Memo's research focus is on improving the accessibility and affordability of hearing health care for older adults with age-related hearing loss. We're very thankful for today's uh, presenter and without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to doctor. Thank you. Okay, hello all. Thank you for joining us this afternoon and for having me here as your speaker in this series. And um, I am going, I titled my talk Hearing and Cognition in Parkinson's. And I do have one very specialized slide about Parkinson's, but I'm really going to talk much more broadly about age related hearing loss because it is so common and it affects both the people that have it and the people communicating with them. Um, and so we'll, we'll take a pretty broad look at how hearing loss affects us as we age. Um, and, and steps we can take to, to um, make sure that we're communicating and engaging as much as we want to. So, and I will have lots of time for questions. I love questions. Everybody has questions about this because everyone <laughs> is affected by this either with someone in their family, right? So, so when we think about the broad spectrum of aging and healthy aging, and we can have the full continuum from, you know, the, the grandmother who's involved in the community and raising the grandkids to the other grandmother who's in nursing home and advanced stages of dementia. And there's a full continuum there, right? And folks who study aging are interested in a lot of different pieces of, of what makes our aging process healthier. So, Someone might be interested in studying particularly how you stay cognitively healthy, how you avoid dementia, avoiding injury, which is most common um, as falls in older adults, 
maintaining physical mobility and physical activity. Health resource utilization is a fancy way of saying how often are folks ending up in the emergency department, hospital stays, how often are they getting readmitted to the hospital for something. And then the other kind of component that I put on this wheel is um, staying socially engaged and active. And so when we think about what makes up our aging and how healthy we are on this continuum, these are some of the different pieces, right? And part of why hearing loss has been talked about more in the last five to 10 years is that over the last 10 years, there's been a lot of studies that have come out that have said, when we look at any of these bubbles, we see a negative association with age-related hearing loss. So these are big population-based studies where they look at a lot of different health outcomes and health components. And over and over again, we keep finding that folks with age-related hearing loss seem to be faring more poorly. And so we're gonna talk about that today. So the objectives of today are to understand kind of that broad impact. How could it be affecting all these different aspects of our aging life? And we'll close with very practical communication tips and tricks. And I happen to know that already one of the questions that has come in is that, like what is the very practical thing to do? And so in fact, that's the last section of our talk today. So just how common is age-related hearing loss? I am a scientist, I'm required to show you at least one graph, there will be two. <laughs> um, so this is prevalence of hearing loss across decades of life. Each blue bar is a decade. And so if you look as the blue bar is getting larger, in our 60s, 70s, 80s, the prevalence of hearing loss really grows. And what we see is about two out of three adults 70 years and older have at least a mild hearing loss, right? So it's so common uh, that we've for a long time treated it as something like, I hear normally for my age, right? Even your doctor might tell you that. And what we're saying now is, even if that's true, two out of three people have some hearing loss, it's still hearing loss that we can support to improve communication, right? And so why is it worth improving communication? That goes back to the first argument I was making that we see age-related hearing loss related to a lot of different aspects of aging. And so here's that same story, but in more of a grocery list format. So we see that folks with age-related hearing loss experience faster rates of cognitive decline, higher incidence of dementia, increased number of falls, reduced physical mobility, increased hospitalization, and increased social isolation. And that is the point that I'm going to keep coming back to over and over again, um, because that's the piece that I like to try to address in my research. So what's going on? How could it be related to all of these different things, right? And one theory is simply a common cause. So some people are aging well, some people are aging less well, and some aspect of that must be true, right? Our body is a closed system. And so the things that are changing inside our body, our brain, our metabolism, they may be affecting not only our hearing, but other aspects, right? But from a clinical perspective and a research perspective, the question that's more interesting is, what about the hearing loss might be accelerating these declines? Because if there's something that we can address, then maybe we can modify it. Maybe we can slow down some of those declines, some of those associations. So there's several hypotheses about what these pathways might be. I'm gonna highlight a few. Um, and the, the framework I'm using is has been um, published by Frank Lynn and his group at Johns Hopkins. Um, and he was my advisor at one point in my training. So I'm gonna lay out his pathways here. So one idea is that when you have hearing loss, it increases your cognitive load, okay? That's just the idea that my brain can only do so much. And when I'm working harder all the time to hear and, and understand, I'm using up some of those cognitive resources that maybe I would have used to remember, 
what I was hearing. Um, and so chronically over time, that takes a toll. And so it might be accelerating some of our declines. Another path is changes in our processing of the sounds coming in results in brain changes. And so we see, for example, folks with age-related hearing loss have actually smaller brain volume. So is some of that structure change because we're getting less sensory input impacting our cognitive and physical health. And then again, the pathway that I'm gonna focus on the most is folks with age-related hearing loss experience more social isolation, and that has a whole bunch of downstream effects that are, that are bad for both our cognitive and our physical health, right? So then the idea becomes, if the hearing loss is accelerating our decline through some of these pathways, then perhaps addressing the hearing loss might help, right? So as promised, <laughs> I'll address some of the very recent research related specifically to hearing loss in Parkinson's. And I'll say that when I talk about age-related hearing loss and the declines, um, I'm kind of going from the direction of we have this hearing loss and it's causing us to decline more quickly. A real focus of the hearing loss and Parkinson's research right now is more directed towards the idea of if we detect some changes in hearing early, does that give us any clues about possible Parkinson's changes that might be coming, okay? And so the idea is that because when we hear, the sound comes in and it has to make its way up to our brain and make sense of it, all that processing that happens, so not just hearing it, but processing the sound is affected by brain changes like the brain changes that are happening when Parkinson's disease is causing some ner nerve connection breakdowns, right? So to highlight how they're um, addressing this, there's studies, for example, where they have people detect changes in rhythm and argue that before someone has other symptoms associated with Parkinson's disease, you might detect some of these changes in your processing of sensory input. And they can do these studies both with auditory input and with tactile. And so that's one of the ways that people are looking for, can we get some earlier markers that give us a clue that we might be having some brain changes happening? Another example of looking at auditory processing in Parkinson's disease is measuring some um, inhibitory pathways that we know that your auditory system should be doing. And so these studies happen in, with objective measures, both elect, like electrodes on the scalp and other objective measures where we expect the system to um, provide some inputs. And when folks are either on or off of their Parkinson's medications that are regulating dopamine, we see different behaviors. And so it's another way that we're looking at how the auditory system might be giving us clues about how the brain is functioning. A third area is related to speech perception and the connection between speech production and speech perception. So challenges in speech production with Parkinson's are often tied to motor um, processes and being able to control those muscles. Um, but there's also some interest in how we're perceiving the sounds of speech and how that might affect our ability to produce them as well. And then the final one I'll highlight uh, is a little bit similar to that top-down pathway, and that has to do with auditory attention. And can you, can you recognize, not you very actively, but can your auditory system recognize what the right target is um, and that comes back to those inhibitory processes where it knows what it should focus on. Um, and so that links back into those dopamine um, behaviors and gives us clues into how the brain is processing sounds through the auditory pathway. So that's just a snippet. And that's not directly the work that I do, but it gives you a sense of how people are using auditory research, how we hear, how we process very fine cues 
and what that might tell us about how our brain is changing. To go into my research a little bit, um, I'll just give you some highlights of what types of questions I'm interested in. So one line of work that tries to think about that cognitive load problem, we recruited um, individuals that have mild cognitive impairments. We know they're experiencing more cognitive change than just your average aging and do studies where they have to listen to speech with difficult background noise to see what kind of effort does it take to understand speech? And is that kind of increasing the cognitive challenge of communication? In that social isolation front, I work with a group care organization called the PACE organization. Some of you may be familiar with them. They're a nationwide program who offers comprehensive care and offers a day center for meals and activities um, and that kind of planning. And so we're thinking about, you know, if two out of three of the folks that attend here have some hearing loss and it's often not treated, how can we make sure that we're setting up communication so people can stay engaged? And one of the ways we look at doing that is through this framework that I developed with them to say, okay, the goal is to allow people to engage. So what pieces of that puzzle do we need to address to, to have that engagement? So one thing is the environment, especially at a group care place where you have a big room, maybe a lot of people eating at the same time, that noisy environment can be difficult. So can we address that? The ability to hear is, can we recognize when people have hearing loss? Can we provide people with amplification when they need it? Um, and then the opportunity and the motivation to engage is also important. It's not enough to give someone hearing aids and then think they'll just start engaging again if they don't have opportunities where, um, where people are supporting that engagement. And so we've been thinking about this in the group setting, but you can also think of it in an individual setting as well, right? To not just fix the hearing loss, but to create some of those opportunities that happen in an environment that's not too loud, for example, um, right? To allow for the person to um, enjoy engagement in order to stay connected. So that's kind of the frame of how I approach access to hearing loss. And so what do we do about access to hearing loss treatment? Not access to hearing loss, sorry, access to hearing loss treatment. Well, we happen to know that it's not great. <laughs> so here's those same blue bars that I showed you before. The blue bars are the amount of hearing loss, but the red bars are the people that report using hearing aids. And it's hugely mismatched, right? So we are way under using hearing aids. And there's a lot of reasons for that, right? Um, I'm going to highlight a few, but you have probably experienced some of these for yourself or for a family member before. First of all, it's expensive. Hearing aids are expensive. Also, not many people really want hearing aids. So expensive is easy to kind of point at and push it away. Um, and I say that because we know in countries where hearing aids are free, we still never get really much better than 40 or 50% of folks with hearing, of adults with hearing loss using hearing aids. Then there's the issue of access. You've got to get to another provider. You've got to get to a specialist. You've got to find that specialist. You've got to understand who to choose and why. And that's not easy, especially when you think of transportation difficulties for older adults and needing someone to get you to appointments and any of those extra hoops that can be challenging. Another challenge is just the technology itself, right? Motor problems are a big challenge for all older adults often, and especially if you have a disorder like Parkinson's that's making dexterity difficult. Um, so handing someone a very small, very expensive device with tiny batteries to change, that's not, that's not motivating. Um, and so we have some uh, just technology difficulty in and of itself. And then finally, this awareness and understanding, I'm gonna roll stigma into that too. People don't want to acknowledge hearing loss, address hearing loss, um, 
It's often treated as just an annoyance between partners or between family members. But what I hope you take away from today's talk is it's not just an annoyance. It really impacts how we participate and how we engage, which affects our overall health. So what we need to do is recognize that none of those barriers exist alone <laughs> and be more creative in our solutions so that we can that we can bridge some of those. And because of how complex the barriers are and because of all of the big studies that I talked about at the beginning that say, hey, it's not just annoying, it affects our broader health. There were um, a series of sort of calls to action between 2015 and 2017, which used to seem like yesterday, but it's getting to be a bit of a little while ago. Um, so the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, we call them PCAST, back in 2015 under President Obama issued a report um, studying why hearing aids were so expensive and what paths might make them more accessible. Um, this set the groundwork for over-the-counter hearing aids, which we're still getting to, but they're coming. The following summer, 2016, the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine issued a very long report with 12 recommendations to increase access to care, um, also supporting the idea of over-the-counter hearing aids, but also taking a bigger frame, like how do we increase the awareness of why it's important to address hearing loss and, and what the broader benefits are. Um, thinking about policy, thinking about communities, thinking about individuals. And then the next step was 2017, where Elizabeth Warren and Chuck Grassley wrote legislation to set the over-the-counter hearing aids in motion. So we've just gotten the instructions from the FDA in the past few months. Um, and so that, that making over-the-counter hearing aids real is still coming, but it's very close now. Um, so let's talk about technology for one slide. <laughs> there are hearing aids as you know them, as you have them or have a family member or have a community member that you know that wears hearing aids. And you get those from a licensed provider and they're custom fit to your ears and they're custom fit to your hearing loss and they're great and they're expensive. Um, then there is a group of devices known as PSAPs, personal sound amplification products. And these come in a lot of different forms, but they often are kind of set to look more like a Bluetooth device. They often connect to your smartphone and they provide a little bit more of a one size fits all, but something that might be a useful tool. And those come more in the ballpark of three to $500 instead of three to five thousand dollars. I'm sure there will be questions about these and I can go into it more. And then the other type of technology that I lean on a lot is this one particularly is called a pocket talker, but these types of headset amplifiers. So you wear headphones and that silver part with the mic that looks like an old Walkman is the microphone. It's got a volume wheel and you just turn up the sound. These are great for when you don't have hearing aids, but you need something at your doctor's appointments or with the television or when someone comes over once a week and sits at the table with you and you can't hear them. So there's different levels and these are more like 50 to $100. So there's ways to use volume amplification that maybe isn't going through all the hoops of getting to an audiologist. And of course, the over-the-counter. We don't know exactly what that's going to look like, right? We're, we're still learning and we're still finding out, but what it hopefully does is create more options so that it's not all or nothing, right? But there's these other steps in between um, that allow us to use some amplification for, for times when we need it. Which brings us to the final and most practical section of the talk communication tips and tricks. And these are habits that we all know we should do, but they're hard to remember to do. And so as I say them to you and you think, well, yeah, I know that. I encourage you to kind of like pick one and check on yourself and remind yourself to do it because we need to do these for anyone we talk to, 
especially if we're talking to someone with hearing loss and or dementia, and even if the person has the best hearing aids money can buy, right? Because back at the beginning, when I talked about how we process the sounds that we hear, even once you can hear it, you still have to take that message, get it to your brain and make sense of it. And our ability to do that changes with age and it changes with Parkinson's and it changes with other forms of dementia too. So we still need to use good behaviors to make it easy to communicate, right? And so this slide in a very simple picture reminds us that it's not all or nothing. As we have hearing loss and as it gets worse, we hear sound, but it's foggy. It's not clear. Um, and when we hear an unclear sound, our brain has to work harder to patch it together, right? So these are some steps we can take to support that. Number one, get the person's attention first. That may be saying their name, that may be waving a hand, that may be touching a shoulder, but don't launch into what you want them to hear until you know that their attention is focused on you, right? And I do this all the time, badly, with my children. I always ask the question and then say their name. Did you brush your teeth, Walter? And at Walter, he looks up. And then I have to say, did you brush your teeth, right? But if I say his name and I wait for him to look, I can ask the question. And that is true with children, with someone that's busy, <laughs> with someone with hearing loss, right? We need to get their attention. Connected to that is being face-to-face. -face. Now, my children do this badly all the time. My face is down. It's in the sink. I've got water running. I can't hear them. And they're behind me talking to me. We have to stop. We have to turn. We have to look at each other. You need to be able to see that person that's talking to you. One, it makes their voice louder, but you're also using the clues on their face. Even when their face is covered with a mask, you're using clues from their eyes and you're using their voice coming directly to you. So get their attention, stop what you're doing, look face to face at each other. And then this isn't the only thing, but it's the last one I'm gonna to present today slow down. When we slow down, we tend to say all of our words more clearly. So we don't have to work as hard to patch them together. We give the person time to patch them together. And we almost always project a little bit more. It says on here, don't shout, but that doesn't mean to go, right? It means to speak slowly and on purpose, right? And that makes it a lot easier for people to hear you because it's not just hearing the sound that came into their ears, but patching it together in the brain and knowing what was said, okay? So that is where I'll stop so that we have plenty, plenty, plenty of time for questions. And I'll leave this slide up for a second so that if anybody wanted to jot down my contact information, they have a minute to see it. Thank you so much, doctor. Uh, very practical information. Uh, we've got a few questions that uh, I'll work through with you. Uh, the first question is, I have Parkinson's disease and my spouse has a hearing deficit, although he does not always acknowledge we struggle with communication. Any recommendations? Yeah, so my first two reactions to that are these last three tips, really making sure that you're focused on each other and looking at each other when it's time to talk. But also that headset amplifier is sort of a, an easier amplification tool to approach because you don't need to use it all the time, right? You can just use it when the two of you need to sit at the table and hear each other well. And that might be an easier sell. It's not just about your hearing loss, but it's about me working hard to speak loudly enough to you and this tool helping us 
bridge that disconnect can be a thing to try. Thank you. Here's another question. Is there any relevance to hearing loss that is bilateral or asymmetrical and the impact this has on cognitive resources? Yeah, that's a great question. So if it's a new hearing loss and it's only happening in one ear, that's a reason to go see your medical doctor because when it's generic age-related hearing loss, it tends to be both ears slowly getting worse. So if something's happening to one ear, it might be a medical something happening. So that's the first thing. But if it's, you know, that you have hearing loss on one side and not the other, I would, you just have to use a little bit different strategies to make communication better for you. It shouldn't be that someone with bilateral versus unilateral is going to experience faster declines, right? Um, which takes me back to my favorite pathway, which is that social isolation. It has more to do with how you're managing it so that you can maintain the kind of activity and engagement that you want to. So um, folks with unilateral hearing loss are less likely to go get hearing aids because they're hearing well through one ear, but if that ear starts to struggle, you may need to act more quickly than someone else, right? Because you're really relying on it and it's, and it's what you've got. Um, but I would say that the, the difference between the two is just making sure that you use the tools you need to keep active. Good, thank you. Next question is, would problems in rhythm detection be related to gait issues and freezing and be a reason why a musical rhythm helps overcome that? Yeah, so I'd be stepping out of my real knowledge base to answer this, um, but, I, but I do think the, the concept of the two are, are related to each other, yes. Thank you. How is age-related hearing loss best described? Hard to hear sounds at certain decibels or what? Yeah, so I think the, the most common thing that you'll hear someone say is, I hear you, but it's just not clear, right? So yes, what's happening is you're, you're losing your hearing at, at some of the pitches, some of the frequencies that we hear, and not all of them. Um, and so the most common age-related hearing loss has good low frequency hearing, meaning you hear, ah, pretty good but bad high frequency hearing, which happens to be where like F and S and TH, these little soft sounds live. And so when you don't hear those soft sounds, that often means that like the ends of words are missing. So things become muffled. Um, and, and if there's background noise, they really become muffled. So that's kind of the, the functional experience of having hearing loss matches those feelings. Good. The next question I have is, can you tell us a little bit about tinnitus? Mm, yeah, I try to avoid it. Um, so tinnitus is difficult because it's not always clear why it's happening. People with hearing loss are more likely to have it than people without. People with a history of noise exposure are more likely to have it than people who did not have that kind of noise impact to their ears, but that, that doesn't always hold, right? You could actually have very normal hearing and have tinnitus. So um, it can be hard to source down the, to trace down the source. Um, the advice that I give for it is that if it has reached the point where it is affecting your sleep, it is worth talking to a specialist about some plans because um, if you stop sleeping well because of it, you're going to be more tired and more stressed, which is going to increase the perception of it and the impact of it. And it becomes this downward cycle. So some people just use a noise machine at night while they sleep and that does the trick, but it is one of those health things that will change and you need to revisit what's working and not working when it does change. Um, some people that are plagued by it all day long wear something that looks like a hearing aid, but it's actually making a masking noise so that they're not hearing the ringing. So there's, there's different approaches if it's bothering you in the daytime or bothering you at night. 
And sometimes it's related to something like a change in medication. So it's, it's always something to bring up when it's new and it's always something to bring up if it changes. And then if it's just sort of there, I'd say bring it up once it starts affecting your sleep and your, your stress and fatigue. Good, thank you. Um, next question is, what is the most important thing to improve your hearing or maintain it? Maintain it is hearing protection. And more often than you think, right? So uh, if you're doing yard work with power tools, if you're going to a movie theater, those are so loud. Um, any kind of sporting event and most concerts, hearing protection is the best way to maintain it. Um, oh, and I forgot the beginning part of the question. To improve hearing. Oh, to improve it. To improve it. Um, I, well, one very functional thing is wax removal. So some older adults have pretty chronic buildup of wax. If you are one of those people having that, um, don't do it on your own. <laughs> don't stick anything in your ear. <laughs> but um, if, if you're one of those people that builds up wax, you, you might already know it. And, and having that removed or cleaned by a nurse or at least under instruction from your medical provider uh, is one of those things that helps, but otherwise it's using good communication and exploring amplification if you never have, and you have the, the ability to do that. Um, recognizing that, that there are some, some cheap and some medium and some specialty options, but um, you can go a long way with really good communication and advocating for yourself when someone's not, those communication things are two ways, right? Like. You can, you can be good at getting someone's attention, but if the person talking to you isn't, you, you might have to give them that instruction. Thank you, doctor. Another question is, what is the best way to go about getting my hearing measured? Yeah, so um, the, the, the easiest thing for me to tell you is to ask your primary care for a referral, say, I am experiencing hearing difficulty, I would like my hearing tested, um, because the layers of insurance and things, I don't know the ins and outs and they're all different. But what I do know is Medicare pays for one full comprehensive diagnostic hearing test per year. And so most of the other insurance companies follow that same suit. Whether or not you have to get a referral, these rules become complicated. So I would just tell your primary care, I would like a hearing test and then let things unfold that way. Good, next question is, you spoke a little bit about uh, some new uh, hearing aids to market. Do you have any recommendations on which ones might be better uh, than others? Yeah, so, so we don't know yet. Um, but what I would say about that is, the technology that comes out in these over-the-counter hearing aids, I think, is going to be perfectly suitable. Microphones are good enough now. Um, we just we know how to make the technology good. What you need to consider is whether or not you need that specialty support to figure out how to use it, when to use it, how to clean it, and kind of how to really actually adopt the habits that you need to become a routine hearing aid user. So. Um, and for some people, that's no problem. And for other people, that may be a big problem, right? Because you do have to kind of like learn new behaviors and practice them and, and have that encouragement from somebody uh, to, to keep at it. So um, so I we're, we're waiting to see like what kind of prices these over-the-counter hearing aids are. Because if they're a couple hundred bucks, then you then you try that out. And maybe it's your, your stepping stone or maybe you just wanted it sometimes and it's perfect. But if they actually come out closer to $1,000, then you got to start thinking about whether or not you want a little bit of support um, based on you, your hearing loss, your lifestyle in order to make that decision. Um, this might be too much in the weeds, but what I hope audiology does is kind of create a whole part of their clinical practice where they do that kind of coaching. So 
they might, you might have a consultation with an audiologist so they can help you figure that out. And then you can go do a little bit of it on your own. Um, so that, that's kind of the, that's the talk I give to audiologists all the time. Um, so we'll have to kind of see uh, how that pans out, I think. Another question is, would using a hearing aid improve my balance? Hmm. Um, I don't know. Uh, I think some might argue that depending on the type of balance dysfunction, it helps with environmental hearing aids, help with environmental awareness in a way that is supportive. Um, but there's, there's just so many sources of where those balance troubles are coming from um, that, that I wouldn't wanna tell you yes. <laughs> Could you speak a little bit about the future research related to this subject matter and what areas you think might uh, open up down the line? Yeah, so one of the really key things happening right now, and I know of two of these studies are pretty big, randomized control trials that specifically look at if I give someone hearing aids before they have any sign of cognitive impairment, do I change that trajectory? So if everybody's kind of declining, but folks with hearing loss are declining more quickly, do the hearing aids change that? Um, and, and we don't know the answer to that. So those are two really big ongoing studies that have the potential to really change the way we deal with treating hearing loss, right? Um, because the, the cynic in me says, big changes happen when, when money talks. So if a big study like that showed, yeah, in fact, changing, treating the hearing loss changes that decline, well, dementia-related declines are expensive to the health system, to families, to insurance. And so it might become more appealing to provide money towards getting hearing aids, which insurance companies are not great about now, on the front end to, to change that decline. So that, that's one of the, like, the biggest, we don't know the answer, but it, it could really change, particularly insurance coverage for, for hearing aids. So that, that's my pie in the sky, I hope. Um, and then, you know, I talked a little bit about the auditory research where the goal is to find early markers of brain changes. Um, and, and so there's some work particular to Parkinson's and even where they compare Parkinson's versus Alzheimer's. Um, but there's also like a whole line of that kind of work going in the Alzheimer's disease research area too. Um, so, you know, in so far that we don't have a treatment for Alzheimer's disease, there's a lot of effort to figuring out the earliest ways to recognize those brain changes. And the reason people are interested in the auditory pathway is that it's not invasive, invasive. And our timing for our auditory system is pretty incredible. So it takes very small brain changes to potentially disrupt that. That's why they think it's one of the ways that we might be able to figure out some of those early detections. So I think it's still like there's research happening there, but I think it's still early to figure out what's sensitive enough to, to use as a marker very broadly. Good. Another question is, how often would you suggest uh, visiting the doctor for wax removal? And would that depend on kind of production of wax? Yeah, certainly um, is variable per person. Um, some of the things that increase wax production is folks that wear hearing aids, actually, because they're putting something in their ear all the time. I will say again, don't put things in your ear. I mean, your hearing aids, sure. But when you use Q-tips, you actually start telling your ear to create more wax. So any types of uh, activity in your ear canal tells those glands like, hey, we got to get this thing out of here. Uh, and it starts making more wax. So, so don't do that. Um, but I think that if you are a wax buildup person, then a, a few consultations with your primary care will kind of figure out the right routine. And they may recommend to you some um, over-the-counter drops that soften the wax so that it will help it move on its own sometimes. So that, that's the kind of question that I would ask them. Yeah, it seems as though one of the things that we've seen a lot of in the course of the pandemic is people working remotely and using all these sorts of air devices. And so yeah. 
that's something that I think this community might just need to be a little careful with. Is that your recommendation? Yeah, yeah, that's certainly true. We're wearing um, we're wearing headphones a lot more uh, than we have in the past. Yeah, is it your recommendation in this sort of situation where somebody has some sort of hearing? you know, impact that they wear the external headset rather than something that goes in into their ear? Um, I would say that it could be just a comfort preference that they they won't, um, they'd be unlikely to, to really cause like damage and irritation. Um, but if they're, but if they're putting their earbud in and they're bringing it out and seeing the wax on it, then that might be a little clue that they, <laughs> that, that it is increasing their their production. Good. So thank you very much. We've been able to get through the majority of the questions. Again, right. if anybody has any additional questions, please reach out to us. Uh, we'll be sending out this presentation to everybody who has attended the event, along with those that have registered for the event. Uh, we want to thank today's presenter, Dr. Mamo from the Department of Communication Disorders at UMass Amherst. I've just got a couple of slides to go through. Yeah. So if you could just forward to the next, please. Good. So I want to talk a little bit about the resources here in Massachusetts. We have an information referral center at Boston University Medical Campus. Uh, the phone number is 617-638-8466. Uh, we can help provide referrals and resources to you. We also provide education and support, support groups, symposiums, educational events. We also provide health and wellness uh, programs here, not only in person, but virtually. We have fitness professionals training program as well as the APDA National Resource Center, uh, Rehabilitation Resource Center here at BU Sargent College. I want to remind everybody that this is the optimism walk season. We have our optimism walk here in Massachusetts uh, for the Northeast uh, this Sunday. We'd love to see you there. There's no obligation to fundraise. Um, please reach out to us if you'd like to attend. We're looking forward to a very large event with a lot of great resources and a real great sense of community. On to the next slide, please. Thank you. So we've got a couple of uh, social media uh, ways for you to stay in contact with APDA. Uh, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, and also on Instagram. We have a website. Uh, that's where the walk information is. Again, it's in Framingham at 11 o'clock at Boated Field. We wanna thank again today's uh, presenter. This is, was great presentation, very practical. Uh, we're, very grateful for all the information that was shared and thank you everybody for participating and all the great questions. Again, you'll be seeing the uh, video as we move forward and thank you so much. We look forward to seeing you again and have a great day.